All right, hey, first, thank you so much for the invitation, Sitka, and, and I want to remind everybody that this is really going to support a very, very important cause, autism research and help for people who have autistic children, and, and I'm really honored to be able to support that here today. And um, I'm going to talk to you about this coming wealth transfer. It's an idea. So, so my job always seems to be to be the guy with like this crazy outside idea um, or set of them. And what I really want to do is, is help you come to appreciate that, that there's some exogenous forces out there that I think we have to look at besides just the world of finances, right? So when we look at 100 years of behavior in the stock market, I think it's important to understand some context for what was happening during that 100 years in this thing we call the natural world. There's another set of pieces here, and we live in very unusual times. So to start, how many people are familiar with my work, have read it, seen it? It's a few, great. Um, the great part is the people who haven't seen it. I love bringing this message uh, to new people. So my business partner and I, Adam, who's sitting in the back there, we, um, we have a mission. This is our mission. We're creating a world worth inheriting, and that's what gets us out of bed in the morning, and, and that's what we're doing. We believe that we're at one of the most unique periods of human history ever. This is a really exceptional time to be alive. And part of that is explained in, uh, this is my, my throwaway sentence, but uh, it's not a throwaway sentence. It's really important that this next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. I've heard it mentioned a couple times here. This is relevant because we're humans and we think linearly. So what just happened becomes our guide for what's going to happen next. Works great most of the time. Works terrible if there's a sharp corner in the road. And we've got a couple of sharp corners here. That's what I'm going to share with you. And uh, this is a sharp corner right here. We're looking at human population over several thousands of years. And uh, this is where I was born in 1962, with about 3 billion people. And now we're at a little over 7. So I've been through one full doubling of population in my lifetime. And if I live to be uh, the same age as, as any of my parents, um, this is uh, a population estimate from the UN, a high, medium, and low, low on the bottom, medium, and blue in the middle. Red is, is, I think, completely unrealistic for a lot of reasons. Let's go with the medium. It means by 2050, there'll be 9.3 billion people. In my adult full lifetime, we will have gone from 3 to 9 billion people. The scariest statistic I know about is that currently there are about a billion people on this planet living a middle-class lifestyle. We all know what that means and what it looks like. By 2030, the idea, if we are on current trajectories, there will be 3 billion people leading a middle-class existence. This is an extraordinary statement. And we need to look at that in the context of resources, particularly. And the most important resource of them all is energy. It is the master resource. If you don't have energy, you really don't have anything else. You know? Give me a, a thick coal seam that's down maybe just a couple hundred feet under some overburden, and you don't give me any energy, it's going to stay down there for a really long time. And when we look at energy, there's a really tight correlation in world growth and GDP, something everybody's been focusing on here for the past couple days, energy itself, and then oil more specifically. And as we look at this, we see that growth or retraction in GDP is very highly correlated with growth or, or advancement in the use of energy. And in particular, oil is right there in the mix. And this is a really, really important concept. And, uh, We've got some really interesting data. You know, remember I started this whole thing with this idea that there's gorillas that we're just not seeing? There's some gorillas right here that I see in the, in the news that are coming up constantly. This is the biggest one. Um, this is some data out of uh, Westwood. Uh, Stephen Coppitz puts this together. Very nicely done. But look at that. From 2005 to 2012, we had a 100% increase in capital expenditures in the world oil industry, from $300 billion to $600 billion. If you added up all the years of CapEx from 2005 to 2012, it's about $2.5 trillion. So let me ask you this. If you invest $2.5 trillion in a business that's about producing something, what would you like to see happen? Prices drop. I'd love to see prices drop. Maybe you'd like to see you produce a little bit more of it, too. Interestingly, over that same period of time, we see that total global crude and condensate production is pretty much dead flat, operating in a 5% band. So $2.5 trillion in total new capex that's doubled, and we got about flat output through that period. This includes the miracle of the U.S. shale output. That's all wrapped into this data. So what does that tell you? How many different explanations do we have for that particular piece of data? This is an astonishing piece of data right here, given just how dependent the world economy is on oil. And not just any oil, but high-quality, high-net energy oil. So this tells me, at least, that we're in a really interesting period of time where 
Oil is just becoming harder and harder to come by, and there's lots of ways we can look at this. Again, um, from Douglas Westwood, we get this chart. This is showing the capex for uh, all the 10 largest uh, international oil companies, the IOCs. And what you're seeing from 2000 on the left, the red line starts at 50 billion. They go up to 262 billion in total combined capital expenditures. This is upstream spending, so this is on production. It's not downstream on refining and stuff like that. And we see in the gray on top, we're looking at millions of barrels of production per day. It tops out at 16.1 in 2007. And despite really ramping up their capital expenditures, their production has been slipping. How many ways can we spin this data? Not that many. In fact, they couldn't figure it out either. This year, for the first time, every one of those listed majors is either freezing capex or cutting it. That's an admission that at current oil prices, they can't support both dividends and returns to shareholders and capex at these levels. Now, these are very intelligent people, and they're working as hard as they can, and it's not for lack of trying. And it's not because they have some big conspiracy to keep oil from us, believe me. They're working it as hard as they can. This is telling us where we are in this industry right now, and it's a really important piece of data. So what it says is that oil basically has been over $100 a barrel for two going on three years. It's not high enough. At 120 a barrel, they'll probably come back in with increased capex, and then that won't be high enough. And then they'll need 140, and then maybe 160. Interestingly, we've seen what happens to certain economies when you get oil over $100 a barrel. Greece, Spain, these are very highly, highly dependent uh, countries on oil imports, and which means that they have a lot of expenditures in that regard. So we have this idea that maybe there's certain levels, thresholds, that economies have hard times uh, adapting to for oil prices. But on the other hand, we have oil prices rising in terms of exploration costs to get it out of the ground from below. And the oil companies have collectively sort of tossed in the towel and said, we need higher oil prices in order for us to continue pursuing our business. In the absence of that, we're going to cut capital expenditures and return uh, money to shareholders, because that's the decision we're going to make. Makes sense. Of course, we have this stuff called tight oil, shale oil, and, and people, I think, are, are rightly uh, focused on it being a pretty big bonanza. It is. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I think it's an incredible bonanza. But what it's not, it's, it's uh, Al, uh, uh, Art Berman I put it best. He said, this isn't a shale oil revolution. This is a shale oil retirement party. And what he meant by that was, this is the EIA showing their total production prediction for tight oil from the United States. They have it peaking in 2021. It goes down after that. You can see subcomponents, Eagleford and Bakken, are the two largest, most productive plays. The rest of them, there's 20 total, but the rest of them are, are fractions of those. So we're looking at this, and that means that by 2021, the United States has now tapped out all of our major conventional reservoirs, and we've gone after the source rocks themselves. There is no plan C in this story. There's nothing beyond source rocks. And we'll have tapped those out. So we have till 2021 to have increasing production off of these. I have some quibbles about whether we get that high or whether the tail is that gentle on the backside, but, but let's just hold it there for a second. We're going out to 2021, and then this is a permanent decline for the United States. And oh, by the way, even if we hit nearly 5 million barrels per day, the United States will still be a net oil importer to the tune of many millions of barrels a day, probably three to four, depending on what you think our demand is going to look like. Not, it's not insignificant that we went from importing 9 million barrels a day and we'll go all the way down to 3. That, that's great. But it's not the same as being a net energy or oil exporter at this point in time. So this is really v actually very critical data. And when I look at all of this and, and think about, you're going to have to give me control back. So this just puts the shale oil in context. Um, what we're looking at here is blue is, is all the conventional oil that was drilled in many decades prior. Red is Alaska. The tight oil is the green showing up on the right. So when you just see the top of this chart drawn out, traced out, it looks really, really impressive. But we have to understand the components of it because the green stuff that's making that tail, that sharp flick up to the right on this chart, is expensive oil. Now here's an interesting piece of data. There are 80 independent operators in North America right now basically drilling across these shale plays plus other operations. If we just look at the shale operators, everybody who's involved or invested in shale for four years running, they've invested $1.50 in CapEx for every single dollar in revenue they've brought forward. You look at the free cash flows from every single one of these companies and they are not just negative, they're hugely negative in the billions of dollars, $3 billion for Chesapeake, $1 billion for Devon. So what this tells me, we were enough years into this story. They've drilled out some of the best spots in the shale. They're doing the best they can. 
They are pouring a dollar fifty in capex for every dollar of earnings. Tell me, when do we get to the cash flow positive part of this story? The answer is, when I talk to people in the oil industry, the hundred dollars a barrel or eighty that they're getting at the wellhead is not sufficient for these yet to be uh, free cash flow positive companies. They need higher oil prices. So all I'm going to tell you about this is whether we think shale is good or bad or we have environmental views on it, cheap oil's in the past. Oil prices have to go higher if we want to get more oil. If we're saying, fine, we don't want to get more oil, it's too expensive, then we have to ask, where's our economic growth going to come from? But if we want more economic growth, we need more oil, but it's going to cost more money, and that pinches economic growth. We're starting to get into a place where the floor is rising and the ceiling is, is settling. At least that's the idea. Something that I think needs to be taken into account when we're thinking about where we're going in this story. Oil's really important. It's 95% of everything it goes from point A to point B. Me, I got here because of oil. Everybody in this room did. 95% of everything that moves in our global economy does so because of oil. Not electricity, not solar, not wind, not coal, because of oil. Now in the environment, this is a second D in the story that I tell, we have some really interesting data points that we have to start considering. You know, in 2013, this is what the map looked like. These are record high temperatures, records. That, that's like across, you know, 150 years of keeping records. We set 2,284 U.S. temperature records in June, and then we fast forward just to January, and those are all record lows in the blue and record snowfall. You see the east coast of the country, records. West coast, record highs. Just saying that we have a slightly, slightly less dependable weather system than we used to have. However we want to explain that, this becomes part of our new reality. And the thing that really concerns me in this story is that oceans are acidifying at the fastest rate in 300 million years of records. So what does acidification mean? Well, there was a really interesting um, story that came out in, uh, in the Seattle uh, Post when they talked about one impact was uh, they have this thriving oyster industry and their oyster hatcheries where they take the larval oysters and they grow them out and then the oyster uh, farmers buy these and spread them into the places where they're going to grow the oysters and they all started dying. We couldn't grow larval oysters because the water was too acidic. Their little shells were just dissolving. And the interesting part of the story, they said, but the good thing is technology rode to the rescue. So the hatcheries now pump fresh water out of an aquifer, salinate it, control the pH, and use that. Whoa, gorilla in the room. Stop. When you're saying that we can't grow certain marine organisms because the water is too acidic and they're starting to, that's a bad sign. It's not a good sign. And we're starting to see this now with um, all sorts of other uh, uh, shelled creatures, in particular these little snails that float around in the water. Um, we're starting to see that acidification has reached a level where it's actually eroding these things. This is the bottom of the food chain. And we see other things, like you look at these blue areas in this world map, this is, these are where we're taking aquifers and drawing them down faster than they can possibly be replenished. Many of these um, replenish on thousand or multi-thousand year time frames. Saudi Arabia in 2016 is going to actually have drawn down its main aquifer to zero, and they're going to have to figure something else out. Not to their credit, they've been using a lot of that aquifer to grow wheat because they want to be wheat independent, but for a desert country that doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Um, but still they're doing it, and their plan is they're going to build desalination plants, and they're going to use a lot of energy to turn salt water into fresh, and that's fine, but they can't do that forever. And so we're seeing these sorts of things are happening all over the place, but China and, and uh, uh, India have some of the largest problems with their aquifers. China can no longer grow all of its food on its own because of water issues. And so they're, when they import wheat from us and corn from us, they're importing water. And so that's one of the global trends that we're seeing. But uh, these trends are, are, getting, are accelerating to the downside. They're not getting better at this point. And then you might, if you pay attention, this is from January of this year, you, you hear things like, wow, monarch butterflies drop. The migration, which goes to Mexico, and they have these millions of butterflies that show up on trees. That might go to zero this year, like no more. And we care, you know, because butterflies are beautiful and it's a big sentinel species. But for everything that you see, like a butterfly that disappears, there's probably a few thousand smaller things that we aren't aware of that are disappearing. Midges and things that we don't really care about, but uh, potentially. But these, this is a food web. And we don't really understand this well yet as humans. We do not understand what it means when you take a part of the food web and pull it out. We're always surprised by what happens next. Bees are having the same issues, all kinds of things. So there's a lot of reasons why this might be happening. Some people think, oh, it's the neonicotinoid class um, uh, pesticides. Maybe. Maybe it's death by a thousand cuts. It's that plus this plus that plus this. Who knows? But it's happening, and it's pretty amazing. And when you put it all together, you know, you get these. I talk with a lot of scientists who are involved in, in this area, and they say we're in the middle of the sixth 
great extinction, the other ones being when asteroids hit and, and whatnot, you know? And this is, this is human caused. And so this is something that's just happening on our watch and, and we might say, well, you know, if, if it turns out there's no more black rhinos anymore, you know, uh, we'll look at stuffed examples in the Smithsonian, but you know, we'll get by. The point I have to make here is we're actually playing with stuff we don't understand all that well. We do not understand how ecosystems work at this point, because most of them are out of sight, out of mind. Uh, we can't actually see them, and so they're out of, out, of our, out of our view. So all of this is actually happening at this point in time, and this becomes, in, for me, one of the largest gorillas in the room. So, so let's imagine for a moment that, so one of the things that's happening with ocean acidification, it's been climbing pretty rapidly since about 1950. Interestingly, since 1950, uh, phytoplankton, which forms the top 10 meters in an ocean, it's this little tiny stuff that, that makes sunlight into a variety of things, including oxygen. Half the world's oxygen comes out of the oceans from the ocean plants. 40% of that phytoplankton is, has declined in those, since 1950. We're losing it at about 1% a year. So the wild card in this is what happens if all of a sudden humans wake up and say, we can't do that, we have to stop carbon going into the atmosphere. It's a game changer. So we can do carbon capture and sequestration, for instance, we can do that. We could take a coal plant, capture the carbon, pump it underground. Hopefully it stays there. But that costs about 40% of the, of the energy that's in the coal. So if we want the same amount of electricity and carbon capture, we have to commit to burning 40% more coal to get there because we're going to have to use that amount of energy to get rid of it. Every single one of these things I'm talking to you about, if we want to ameliorate it, it's just going to be an extraordinarily, if not hideously, expensive proposition. So when I get to the economy, you know, we hear all this stuff, you know, this is really good news, right? We got stocks at or near all-time highs and everybody's happy because bonds, whether they're sovereign or corporate or junk, seem to be at or near all-time highs. We've got housing in, in many, if not most, key markets in the United States back at all-time highs. I guess good if you own one, bad if you're thinking about trying to buy one as a first-timer, but this is all presented as, as good news. And we've had plenty of context to understand why these asset prices have been driven up. It's been a matter of policy, an effective policy, too. I'll, I'll give high marks. Um, now we get to this part of the story, where I promised, you know, these people are all lining up for a reassuring lie and there's nobody lined up for an inconvenient truth. So uh, I'll tell you some lies. Nah, we're going into the inconvenient part. Just kidding. So look at the, you know, we've seen this chart. This is uh, S&P over on a monthly chart. And in my mind, there's a variety of explanations for why we had each one of these sequential bubbles. This first one happened because sweep accounts were initiated. If you don't know what those are, ask me a question later. Um, I'll get into that at some other point. And that sort of fell apart. And then we had uh, Al Greenspan's 1% blowout special forever right there that uh, bottomed out in about February 2003. That gave us a second bubble. Uh, that didn't work so good. So then we got 0% interest rates plus QE, and we got this one. And so the Fed is just desperately doing everything it can to maintain a system, and I understand why they're doing it. If I was in their shoes, I might do exactly the same stuff. But I don't know how many of you have read um, Thomas Piketty's new book. I haven't, um, but I've read enough reviews to know that what he's doing is explaining that if we look at capitalism, we're going to see this grand inequality in wealth. And what he failed to understand is this next part I want to go into, which is that that's a feature of the system. It's not a problem. It's a feature. If you have a debt-based money system, which is what we've got, and you run this experiment long enough, you can do, you just build it in a spreadsheet very easily, you will discover that eventually one entity or person owns everything and everybody in the world owes them. So a quick thought experiment, if we said like a, an endowment which doesn't have a redistributive policy, if Yale, in, which was founded in 1701, started with $1,000 and they earned a 10% real rate of return above what they needed to use that endowment for, by now that endowment would be worth uh, around $9 trillion. So it's actually a, you know, just a gigantic that's just from a single thousand dollars I'm allowed to compound over a few years, right? So we look at the balance sheets of the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, starting back in 2006 to current. It's up about 5.8 trillion, which is a fun number because the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. If you let right light run for a year, it travels 5.8 trillion miles. So we basically have a light year of printing in this. I only bring that up because what's a, what is a trillion? I don't know. It's a big number. It's huge, right? But we're doing this because we need to have this system continually expand. And so this is a chart, this is total credit market debt, and, and Mish opened with this. You know, I've circled the part that almost brought down the free world. That was it. That hiccup right there created immense panic. How many people in this room actually took cash out of the bank when that thing was breaking in 2008? 
Yeah, a lot of people, including I read this great Wall Street Journal article about a CEO of a major bank was being called down to an emergency meeting two in the morning with Paulson and everybody, and as he was walking across the marble hall of his bank, he went over to the ATM and maxed out the cash he could take from it because he didn't know what was going to happen later that day. That happened because we had that little hiccup right there where we suddenly didn't have accelerating credit creation. Our system is completely dependent on constant expansion of the money system. And I don't have time here uh, to go into all of the reasons why for this, so I'm just going to note that and I've got plenty of data on it. But here's a fun thought experiment. That was compounding from that period over that entire stretch. It's compounding at 7.9% per annum. Let's call it 8%. That's the average compound rate. So what if we took the same credit market debt starting at about 60 trillion right now and compounded that for the next 30 years at that same 8% rate, that means that just the United States credit market debt would be worth 573 trillion in the year 2043. It's only at 60 trillion. What are we going to borrow 510 trillion for? If you have an answer for that, feel free to think the next 30 years will look just like the last 30. If not, we're not going to create debt at, at the same rate, at least in current dollar terms. Important point on that one. So hey, okay, so we're going to slow it down. Let's just compound it at 4% for the next 30 years. Great. That means we're only going to go from about 60 trillion to over 190 trillion. So again, what are we going to borrow all that money for? And by the way, even at 4%, that means we're doubling at about every 18 years. So that means in the next 18 years, we have to borrow up a full 60 trillion. What would we borrow that for? These are all questions that need to be answered because that, you know, the whole real residential real estate mortgage market is what, maybe 10 trillion at this point? So we would have to come up with six new ones or something. It's an important question. So what I'm really getting at here is that what we've experienced in the past, in the past 20, 30, 40 years, whatever your horizon is, to carry that forward and have everything work just the same, we have to have extraordinary levels of debt creation. My hypothesis and belief system is that we won't do this. We won't be able to. We're going to have slower credit growth, which has knock-on impacts for all kinds of things price earnings ratios, prices of things, you name it. That's, that's my hypothesis. So I, I come up with this statement, and it's backed up by, by some thinking like what you saw there and, and, and much more. Uh, got it in book form and DVD, whatever, whatever is helpful to you. Happy to share that. And you know, these are the series of questions that I ask when I'm trying to frame for myself, where do I want to position my resilience, my wealth, what might happen? So in 20 years, are we going to have more people or fewer on the face of the planet? You can answer these for yourself silently. Will oil be harder and more expensive to find or cheaper and easier? Uh, will there be more net energy per capita or will there be less? How about uh, will coal and other minerals be easier to mine and of higher quality or the opposite? Will there be more conflicts over resources or fewer? Will aquifers have more water in them or less? Will more soil be built up or be lost to erosion? And finally, will, the, will there be more carbon in the atmosphere or less? You know, it depends on whether you're on the green side or the red side of these statements. It gives you a sense of, of how you might want to be positioning yourself over the long haul. And the thing that I'm here to talk about, which I'm getting to the, to the final the, the part that I wanted to share, is that everything that I was trained to believe about capital is all financial capital. Adam and I spend a lot of time going through the base data to convince people of two things. They need to be more resilient and more engaged. On the resilience front, I want to just talk to you about that, that piece right now. Because the resilience, you can be financially resilient if you're you know, really well diversified, but that's not going to be the be all end all if these risks that I've, I've outlined come true. So I want to talk about this idea of a wealth transfer. And we already have many historical examples of this. One that everybody's certainly familiar with because there's great pictures. Uh, is the Weimar Germany period, right? And so that was pretty easy to understand. There was all this money printing for a variety of reasons. It happened, and it destroyed purchasing power for people. There was this extraordinary period of rampant inflation, and if you read books on it, it's almost always described as a period of intense wealth destruction. And it's true. People were wiped out. Middle class, upper middle class, people got destroyed. But it wasn't a wealth destruction, because you'll notice before it happened and after it happened, there were still just as many houses, factories, and square feet of arable land in the country. But who owned them changed. That did change. The productive assets didn't change. Ownership certainly did. And so this is, this is the, the part I want to talk about. And I think about wealth. This is based on um, the work of E.F. Schumacher of the Small is Beautiful crowd. And there's ideas that wealth comes in a pyramid. 
There's primary wealth, secondary wealth, tertiary wealth. One follows the other. Primary wealth is things like rich soils, clean water, you've got thick coal seams, uh, high quality ores, you've got uh, rich fishing grounds. It's the stuff that's sitting there. If you have access to this ownership of it, you have primary wealth. As humans, most of this stuff doesn't have a lot of value to us economically until we transform it into secondary wealth. So ore becomes steel, fish makes it to market, uh, soil becomes food in the store, or trees become lumber. But notice in this that without any primary wealth, you can't make secondary wealth. If you don't have the ore, you can't make the steel. No fish, no fish, right? So primary wealth is first, secondary wealth follows. Tertiary wealth, this is the UBS trading floor, um, are all the abstractions that we place on this stuff, right? It's currencies, derivatives, stocks, bonds. All of those have intense value to us, but if we back up a second, we realize they have no meaning, no value if we can't buy something with it. Like, what is a billion dollars if there's no secondary wealth for you to spend it on, right? It's pretty meaningless. So in this, in this story, the, the relationship that I want to just carve out here is that without primary and secondary wealth, tertiary wealth has no value. So this is where the story starts to get really interesting because in this pyramid, um, oh wait, before I get to the pyramid, you know, we're all familiar with this idea. We talk about inflation or deflation, we're measuring prices, that's always the wrong stuff. Really when we're talking about um, prices, what we really mean is that real wealth primary and secondary is some, in some balance to money, which includes credit, right? I'm using a very gross, large definition of money. It's not just currency. Uh, if there's balance, that's fine, and if you get out of balance, we experience that either as deflation if there's not enough money relative to real things, and we experience that as inflation if there's too much money compared to real stuff. We are getting to an extraordinary periods, uh, period of imbalance in this story. You've heard a lot of that talked about within the financial framework, but I need to draw it out to the real wealth, primary and secondary. And so what we're seeing is this tertiary piece is expanding constantly. Everything the Fed has done can be examined and understood through a lens of saying we need to keep credit and money equivalents growing in the system. And if the private sector can't do it, we'll turn to the public sector. They'll do it for a while. You want to look at you know, that, that whole period where household and more specifically the shadow banking financial wealth debt was being absolutely reduced, delevered, destroyed, however that was happening and exactly balancing that, what are these huge explosions in federal, in federal uh, debt. So people look at that and say, wow, look at all that borrowing the government was doing. They had to, to keep that tertiary system expanding constantly, but you just wander over here and we find that primary and secondary is either expanding more slowly or contracting or even disappearing in the case of aquifers and certain species and things like that. This thing is, is this is the primary tension, more claims same amount or even less stuff that's out there. And on a per capita basis, this story gets really kind of hairy as we go from seven to nine billion. So this is an important point. Money is just a claim on things. Debt is a claim on money, future money particularly. So where money printing in Weimar Germany destroyed purchasing power right there instantaneously in that moment, I submit to you that just piling up debts destroys purchasing power too, but not immediately, does it later doesn't do it right away. Makes it a little harder to detect. That makes it, for humans that are wired linearly, it makes it a little hard to, to, to figure out, particularly if you're doing it at levels that have never been seen before historically, so we don't have a lot of good history on our side. So money's a claim on things, debt's a claim on future money. And when those claims are piling up, this is my main conclusion, which is that the only defense to a wealth transfer, which by the way, they tend to happen pretty quickly, is you gotta be either closest to the exit or you gotta leave first. But the idea that everybody holds is, you know what, when that starts happening, I'll just duck out and head to the other guy. Everybody thinks that. By definition, can't happen. By definition, wealth transfers take the most money from the most people. And whether it's by a process of inflation or deflation, I'm agnostic, I don't know at this point. I'm still weighing that one out. Personally, weighing a little more to the inflation side uh, after we get a little more deflationary impulse. I think the Fed will do whatever it takes to avoid deflation because that will destroy institutions, countries, political careers, social unrest. It's a very ugly place to go. So they'll attempt to print it. Um, that's just a, an idea I have. But why wait around to participate? Why not get yourself um, into a place where you can actually be more resilient by moving your financial capital out into other forms of capital? So this is my final admonition to you. Do epic shit. Go forth and be a force of the awesome. The world needs you. 
And uh, it really does. This is, we're really living in times where there's a lot of gorillas in the room. We have to look at them squarely, understand them for what they are, and then face them and do something about it. So that's my talk. Thank you much. Great. Are we going to take one question? Or are we going to take two questions and then we'll break out? Two questions and then at the breakouts or find me later if you have other questions. So, Chris, uh, um, is John Holland, who uh, sort of developed genetic algorithms and that sort of thing, wrote a book on complex adaptive systems. And one of the things he says is when you look at a rainforest and you look at the soil, the soil is actually pretty crummy. But the soil is actually pretty crummy in a in a you know rainforest. But what allows that complex adaptive system to to maintain this enormous array of life is its ability to recycle. And he and he and he says that the, the that the ability of ele, that the elements that survive in a complex adaptive system. You know, because if you cut down the trees, the the soil depletes almost instantly out of these places. But what keeps all this life going is, and the items that survive in that system are those that recycle resources, because those are the things that keep the you know the nutrients from going off and everything like that. And it it it's always struck me when I read that um, that there's an analogy to what you do and what you suggest. Uh, and I and I just wanted you to explore that a little bit in terms of you know as investors as as you know just people who are living their lives, what are the kinds of things that would go into that same that same idea that the elements that that really survive are the ones that somehow are able to recycle and rechannel resources in order for them to be used again in that system? Yeah, great question. Uh, so two parts of that. The first is. The energy story is, is, is the part I can deal with most rapidly on that. So when we say we're burning fossil fuels, it's coal, it's methane, it's, it's petroleum. Those are all expressions of ancient sunlight that came down, hit some plant matter, particularly usually algae in a shallow sea or uh, uh, in a carboniferous forest, and it got built up. So really, we're, humans are going to take about 400 million years of ancient sunlight and burn through it in about 200 years, roughly. Um, it's an incredible explosion of energy, and you get to do stuff with that. But, but when you take a complex hydrocarbon and you burn it and turn it into carbon dioxide and water, you only get to do that once, right? So the famous saying is you only get to burn a lump of coal once. So you decide what you want to do with it, right? Um, heat your home, move an engine, that, all that's fine. Uh, so we can't recycle energy. That, that's sort of a one-way arrow, and you, you have a pile of it. So think of it like a, a, it's a trust balance, and we're living off of that. And it's not really generating any interest for us at this point. So that's what we know about fossil fuels. Um, and the idea, though, of the opportunities that sit in this, we are going to have to learn how to recycle stuff much, much better as a species. And we can. And I think we, we will, because we'll have to. So here's one example. We mine phosphate out of the ground, which also got laid down for over a long time. We put it on a field in Iowa. It lands on somebody's dinner plate. And skipping over one step, it gets flushed out into the ocean. It's a one-way arrow from a non-renewable mineral resource that gets dispersed into the ocean. It's such a dilution level that it, economically we can't get it back, right, unless we boil the oceans, right? And, and so closing that loop will present enormous opportunities. We'll do it eventually because we have to, right, because it's a non-renewable. There's only so much of it. But there's a lot of examples where we have those where we're dis we, we are, humans might be viewed as dispersive agents. Like, that's what we do best. We take concentrated stuff and we spread it out very thinly, right? <laughs> You know, one of my favorite substances is silver. It's just extraordinary industrially. I love it as an industrial metal. We're losing it at the molecular level constantly. So a lot has been mined. Maybe half of it still exists. The rest has been lost to non-economic uh, dispersion. And that's happening with all sorts of critical things, indium, gallium, you name it. Um, and it would be great if we understood that and started uh, holding on to those. But those, those become reduce, reuse, recycle with sort of this feel-good greeny slogan. I think it becomes the operating imperative that if I see a company doing that better than another company, they're positioning themselves for the future. And by the way, these things take time. So Rico is a company. They have a lot of these rare things in their toner, toner cartridges, and other things. And they have this huge nested uh, recycling loop where they, don't, they no longer sell the toner cartridges to their business clients. They lease them and get them back because they need the elements that are in those, particularly the rare elements. And so I see them going through this. It took them years to set up this thing of 
managing all of that, but they found that it was much, much, much more cost effective to recover rather than to buy new stuff. And, but they also knew that they couldn't count on that new stuff being there. It was the first time, I, it was five years ago, first time I ever saw a company engineer stand up and put one of a chart up that I might put up, which is here's how many years left of indium we have left, and here's where it fits into our manufacturing process. We have no substitution for it, so we're no longer depending that it's going to be there. We're building our business processes around capturing this and keeping it within our loops. Anybody else? Yeah. Where does nuclear energy fit in? Well, um, I'm not a huge, uh, I'm not hugely hopeful about conventional nuclear as it exists, where we take uranium. 235, and we put it into a boiling water reactor or some equivalent, like the ones that are still being built. Um, partly because 20% of all the nuclear energy that's been used in the past 10 years has come from decommissioned warheads from uh, the, the megawatts, um, sorry, megatons to megawatts program where Soviet uh, stockpiles were turned into uranium fuel. China's building 36 new nuclear plants. They've scoured and locked up contracts for all, pretty much all known um, mining output for uranium because they need at least a 40-year commitment of uranium to, to justify any given plant. So I think we can go maybe, an, maybe another 100 plants if we wanted to. We would actually have to go to about 4,000 nuclear plants to uh, equal the amount of uh, energy that's in the oil that we're burning as a, nation, as, a, as a globe right now. There's not enough uranium for it. I'm a huge fan of, but just only theoretically, of this idea of using thorium, liquid thorium um, reactors. We had a couple running at Oak Ridge in the late 50s, early 60s. We didn't use it because it creates uh, U-233 as a byproduct. Stuff doesn't blow up really nice. It makes bad bombs. So we didn't go down that path, but, but we actually have literally thousands of years of, of thorium at our disposal. And the cool thing about that stuff is it completely consumes all the radioactive elements in its cycle. And if it melts down, it's a liquid, it's a liquid uh, uh, thorium, it's a liquid salt reactor, meaning that if it does melt down, the, it actually comes out and just cools into a hard mass. It has to be contained at a very, very high heat. So any meltdown is actually it stops the entire reaction. Uh, so those are possible. China came over two years ago, got all of our plans for free because they were on, you know, available, um, and ran back. And they have 150 PhDs working on developing these reactors right now. They plan to have a pilot uh, one by 2020, a commercial available by 2025. So it's possible that later on we will be buying thorium technology from them, uh, but in this country there's no interest in it at this point. So that's it. We're going to break into our groups now, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So we'll just kind of keep this informal. We'll um, bring uh, Mish and Chris up to the front here and pull up some chairs, you know, get comfortable. We'll just spend like uh, the next 20 or, or so minutes and take, get a little break in as well, but we'll start chatting and then we'll come back for Mish's presentation.